This is BBC One. It's now 9.15, time for Sunday worship. On this last Sunday in Advent, we join the congregation at Blackfriars, Oxford, for their family mass. The service is introduced by Father Herbert McCabe. Hello and welcome, or welcome back, to our family mass here at Blackfriars for the last of our Advent celebrations of hope. Uh, today we shall be thinking about both birth and death. The birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, and what this means for our death. We should be looking at the reality of death, and we'll be looking at Christ's promise, which takes us into, through, and beyond death, to hope in the mystery of resurrection and eternal life. We shall see that in hope, even death itself becomes a new kind of birth. So let's begin our celebration by singing the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In a few days we will be celebrating the birth of Jesus, Son of God, Son of Mary, in the stable at Bethlehem. Since he humbled himself to come into our presence, let us not be afraid or too proud to come into his presence at this Mass and ask for our sins to be forgiven.
Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us all our sins, deliver us from every evil, save and strengthen us in every good work, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, fill our hearts with your love, and as you reveal to us by an angel the coming of your Son as man, so lead us through his suffering and death to the glory of his resurrection, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the word of the Lord. of St. Paul to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and designated Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. The Virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The Christmas season is upon us, the season of festivity and joy, the feast of warmth and light and life in the midst of winter. So I want to talk about death. Um, I'm not just being perverse, for as we'll see, the hope that we celebrate in Advent has a great deal to do with death. But in any case, Although the shop windows and the advertisers uh, will not let us think about it much, Christmas is, in many ways, a season of death. I'm told there are more suicides at Christmas than at other times of the year. I think the gaiety and glitter that we associate with Christmas can make it a very bitter time for lonely people who have no parties to go to and no relatives to visit and feast with. It's also a time when many old people die from what we call natural causes, which often, quite often, means that we've deprived them of enough money to keep warm. Besides all this, Christmas is a time when we remember most poignantly friends who have died, who are not there as they used to be to join in the feast. 
two very close friends of mine died earlier this year, and I know that I'm going to miss them particularly at Christmas. Surprisingly, Christmas can be a time of mourning just because it's a time of celebration. So, I want to talk a bit about death and mourning. I want to talk about why we should be angry about death. I want to suggest that just as at the center of our sorrow for sin we discover forgiveness, so we can discover at the center of our grief a hope in resurrection. Death, human death, is in the first place an outrage. I mean it's outrageous in the way that the death of other animals is not. Because in human death, nature takes back more than it's lent us. Every human death is a kind of murder. Put it this way, as every cat person knows, each cat is a unique individual, different from every other cat. But it's unique because of what it's received from nature from its genetic makeup and from what's happened to it during its life. When a cat dies, this unique life is no more. And this is, of course, sad, but nature has simply taken back what it has given. I can grieve for the death of a cat, but with the death of a friend, there's something much more, something of a different kind. We have an instinct that finds the death of a friend somehow unfair, outrageous. And I think we are right to trust this instinct. For my friend is a unique, irreplaceable person, not just because of what she has received from nature, but because of what she herself has made of herself. By her own free decisions, by the spontaneous love she has, by her failings, by all the things we could praise her for or blame her for. For unlike the cat, my friend was in part responsible for herself. In a way, she created the kind of person she was. She wasn't just made, she also made herself. She belonged to herself. She wasn't just a part of nature. And now, in the natural course of things, the lifetime of a body has come to an end. But nature, in claiming back her own, has also taken away the unique personality of that body, which nature did not give. There are people who will pretend to see death as quite natural, as natural as birth. But I think they should look again. Human life, unlike other life, is more than a simple cycle of birth, growth, maturity, decline, death. During and within this cycle, there is a story. There's the development of a person, which is not a cycle, but a continuing story that's arbitrarily cut off by death. Most people will agree that there's something shocking in the death of a child who hasn't had a chance even to live out her whole human life cycle. But I think that in one way, every human death is the death of a child. Every death cuts off a story that has infinite possibilities ahead of it. Human love is about bodies about being with each other, about bodily, physical presence to each other. Those who love find it hard to be separated from each other, even for a few weeks, even by a few miles. They try to communicate, which is a way of trying to be bodily present. Death is terrible because it is so absolute a bodily separation, the final bodily absence. What had been a living body in which a unique personality was present to you is now not a human body anymore. It's lifeless clay. 
We are right to be angry about death, and anger is a large part of mourning for the dead. And we are right to be angry with God. It's just as appropriate to be angry with God as it is to beg his forgiveness or to ask him for anything in prayer. Of course, God doesn't literally need to be told what we want and what we need. But as we saw earlier, it still made sense to lay our desires before God. In the same way, of course, God is not literally blameworthy, but it still makes sense for us to lay our anger before him. Remember that in all these cases, we are dealing with images of God. And in all these cases, the literal truth is that the initiative is always with God. What is happening is not something happening to God, but to ourselves by the initiative of God's grace. As we saw last time, we need, besides the image of the God who is relenting, accepting, also the image of the God who is angry at injustice. And now I say we also need the image of the God with whom we can be angry. If you think this is shocking and irreligious, go back to the Bible, read the Psalms, read Jeremiah, read the angry words of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we suppress our anger at death, if we don't allow ourselves to mourn, or if society or the church will not allow us to mourn, if we do, if that happens, we'll pretend to ourselves that there is no death. And then we shan't cope with it. To, pre to pretend that death is unreal is to be very like those who pretend they have no sin, the self righteous as we saw last time, contrition is a kind of mourning for sin. It goes with confession, with being able to admit that we are sinners, and that nonetheless God loves us and forgives us. It's one and the same gift, one and the same gift of God for us to admit to our sin in sorrow and for it to be forgiven. And it's one and the same gift of God for us to mourn for the reality of death and to have hope in the resurrection. Those who can't admit the reality of death sometimes convince themselves that we are not really these bodily animals. The real me, they think, is not this body, but a spiritual soul loosely attached to the body. This true spiritual me, they think, doesn't die, it just carries on when the body disintegrates. Now this disowning of our bodies leads to, to philosophical muddles, to psychological troubles, and to very bad theology. I am this material animal that God has made. True, I'm this special kind of animal that God has made able to make itself, to be creative and free, but I'm not some idealized spirit, harnessed to a dying animal, I am this dying animal. I have hope beyond death, not because I think I am a phantom, constitutionally incapable of death. I have hope because the bodily animal, Jesus Christ, has conquered death. Uh, philosophers have sometimes argued that there is an immortal element in me, a part of my life that does not die, and they may well be right. In fact, I usually think they are right. Of course, that bit of me, that soul, would not be me. What I am is this whole living, breathing, thinking animal. But perhaps some of what it is for me to live humanly and creatively is not subject to decay. Perhaps, but anyway, I do not hope because of what philosophers argue any more than I have faith because of what philosophers argue. I have hope because God raised Jesus from the dead and I am promised resurrection and eternal life in him. 
Jesus was not immortal. He was a mortal man and he died. But God conquered death in him and now he has a new immortal bodily human life. And because he is not dead, because he is bodily, he can be with us truly and humanly in the body. To try to understand the resurrection, or rather to cope with the fact that we cannot understand it, we need to go back to what we saw about so-called unanswered prayer. You may remember that I said that all our prayer is a kind of sharing in the great prayer, which is the cross. When Jesus, in loving obedience to his Father, accepted failure and handed his whole work over to his Father. This was the prayer that was answered by his resurrection and the redemption of the world. Now, when we die in faith, we share in the death of Jesus. We share in the prayer, which is the cross. And we share in the answer to that prayer. You may remember that I said there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. God never gives us less than we ask. But sometimes he gives us so much more, so much more than we ask, that we don't yet recognize it as an answer at all. Sometimes, true, he treats us as children and gives us simply what we ask, and that's easy and delightful. But sometimes he gives us a greater gift, and begins to show us that we want something greater. He helps us to grow up. Now, sometimes the divine power does answer the prayer for life by giving us just exactly what we ask, as when the dead are brought back to life, like Lazarus. But usually, he gives us far more than that. He gives us resurrection, which is more than we can yet understand more than we know enough to ask for. Like so-called unanswered prayers, death is also a process by which we learn and grow up. The gift of resurrection looks to us now like a prayer that has not been heard, not been answered, ignored, because we're not yet grown up enough to recognize it as what we really want. But if through our lives we've prayed, then we know quite well how often we've seen by hindsight how what looked like a non-heard non prayer was a prayer answered in ways that we couldn't understand at the time. It will be so with our resurrection. We shall look back and see that our new transfigured human life is really what the prayer of our death was all for, just as the resurrection of Jesus was what the prayer of Gethsemane and the cross was all for. But meantime, let us not pretend that for most of us death seems anything but darkness and loss, but a darkness in which we have hope. Christians have no theory about life after death. We don't think we're grown up enough, old enough to understand such eternal life. We have instead our faith in the love of the Father, our faith in Jesus Christ, that the spirit of love in us will conquer death, and our future is the substance of things hoped for. Now shall we express our faith and hope by saying the creed together. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, 
and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Lord, we ask that you make us aware of our own part in the unequal distribution and misuse of the wealth and resources you gave us, the misuse of power through unjust structures. Give us the hope to transform our society. Lord, hear us. Lord, we pray for the people of South Africa for the liberals who work for change, for the children in detention there, for the migrant workers detached from their families, for the people compulsorily uprooted and sent to homelands which are not their homes, for those who have borne continual hardship, torture and repression patiently. Give us the hope to determine that we will no longer stand idly by. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious, hear us. Lord, we are ashamed of living in a society where so many are homeless, so many forced to live at less than human level, their only home, bed and breakfast accommodation, in which we are allowing malnutrition to occur. We pray for your forgiveness and that of those disadvantaged by our indifference. Lord, hear us. As we prepare to rejoice at this season of Christmas, we remember all who will die as a result of starvation and our neglect. May we take up the challenge to follow the path revealed to us by Christ with a determination that things must change. Lord, hear us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers and answer them through him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Sisters and brothers, let us pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Lord, may the power of the Spirit, which sanctified Mary, the mother of your Son, make holy the gifts we place upon this altar. Grant this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We give to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. His future coming was proclaimed by all the prophets. The Virgin Mother bore him in her womb with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist was his herald and made him known when at last he came. In his love, Christ has filled us with joy as we prepare to celebrate his birth, so that when he comes, he may find us watching in prayer, our hearts filled with wonder and praise. And so, with all the choirs of angels in heaven, we proclaim your glory and join in their unending hymn of praise. you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. <clears throat> when supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died.
In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love, together with John Paul, our Pope, Morris, our Bishop, and all the clergy and people. Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin, Mother of God, with the Apostles, and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Let us pray for the coming of the kingdom as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin, and protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us offer one another the sign of peace. we have to say farewell to you not just for a week but for much longer because this is the last of our Advent celebrations. Knowing that you were there praying, praying with us has made a wonderful difference to the celebration here and we thank you for that. You will be in our hearts and minds for a very long time. This Christmas we share with you the spirit of peace and love that comes to us from the Father through the human life of his son who was born in poverty died in shame and brings us to glory. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come down upon us all and remain forever. Amen. On this last Sunday in Advent, Sunday worship came from Blackfriars, Oxford.
The Mass was celebrated by Father Roger Ruston, and the preacher was Father Herbert McCabe. The music was directed by Jill Elliott, and television presentation was by Anne Richardson and David Craig.